be amended to start this, this morning's service uh, by, by, by sharing something I'm, I'm seeing in the spirit, and I'm just going to share it. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when I was in the military and even at school in, in South Africa, every year we did a Founders Day where where um, our school was like a hundred years old, so we would every year and a day we celebrated the founders and we listed all of the people who died in the First World War and Second World War and um, served their country. And then we'd do a ceremony of the changing of the God. And um, the ceremony of the changing of the God is a, is a, is a military cer cer ceremony where the God uh, the guards that were looking after the camp at the end of their guard duty would stand at attention, present their arms, their weapons, for inspection. They'd get their weapons inspected by the rank, and then they would be released from duty. And there would be a changing of the guards, and they would be on called the changing of the guard. And then and the old guard would, would, would walk, would march out, and the new guard would come in. And the new guard would come in, they would present their arms for inspection, and then get commissioned as the new guard. I want to tell you what I saw this morning in, in the Bahamas is, um, is there's a changing of the guard. Um, there's a, a revival coming to the Bahamas. We know that. We've prophesied it. Every single pastor in the Bahamas agrees with me, even the Catholic pastor. <laughs> I said, the Catholic pastor, I said, you know, there's a move of God coming to the Bahamas. I said, oh, no, we've been believing that for years. I was like, what? The Catholic? <laughs> but they believe it, but it is coming. But with that coming is a changing of the God. Um, it is a fresh leadership. It's a new voice, a new sound, a new responsibility held on the shoulders of new people. Not disrespecting the old people, and old gods never do disrespect. But God's raising up something new. Whenever God raises up a remove of God, revival, always within it are leaders. Doesn't do it without leaders. Doesn't do it without people. Remember, um, a very interesting part of the scripture for me was when, when the, the apostles in the New Testament set apart Paul and Barnabas. So when Paul and Barnabas were getting ready and they were young, excited preachers, this is what happened. The Holy Spirit, says the Bible says, the Holy Spirit said to the elders in Antioch, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas. Now think about it. If I was the eldest, I would have said to the Holy Spirit, you the Holy Spirit, you do it. You know, the Holy Spirit, why are you telling me to set apart for the body of when you're the man? Because the order works like that. People cannot be set apart by God unless under a heart. People that tell you, oh, God sent me, so where are you from? No way, don't receive them. They're not under authority, you're not going to be here. Authority is important. And, um, and so, as God raises up a, a, a move, a wind of revival through the Bahamas, He will raise up a new God. And I'll tell you a story, when I first went to the Netherlands, I went to preach in the Netherlands, in Holland, and God opened the doors for me in the Highlands, in, in sorry, the, in the country of the Netherlands, that um, the two biggest churches in the Netherlands became friends of mine. So the, the one church was, was the fastest growing church in Europe at the time. It had 10,000 members in Amsterdam. Wow. Wow. The, if you can put a 10,000 member church in Amsterdam, something happened. It's a tough place. And, uh, and and they began, the pastors began to friends, huh? my personal friends. So I flew into Holland on this one trip, oh. and I was preaching in, in a church called Door Breakers, it's a large church, and I was invited to preach 
on the second opening Sunday of the River Amsterdam. Wow. The River Church in Amsterdam. Yeah. With Ben Crispy. So I went to, I was so excited because I love, I love the river. I love Dr. Rocky Hunt Brown. Him and I have been friends for 30 years. Um, and I love what God's doing through the movement. So I went to preaching in Ben's church, and I knew by my spirit that God was going to do something great through that church in that location. So, and the church only had about 20 members. And every one of the members that were in the church were a result of Ben and the team leading them to Christ on the street. Mm -hmm. When Ben went in, he had no pain. No one, he didn't get a building, he didn't get a dollar, he didn't get support from anybody. Even his own father refused to come to the church. His father was an outspoken leader. He said, I'm not going to anyone's son's church. He was his father. He went, Ben was like, I am it. And the members were there. And I'm telling you, I saw what God was doing. It was similar to this. So I went back to Peter Payton. Power, the pastor of Gold Breakers, largest pastor church, fastest growing church in Europe, largest church in the Netherlands. And I said to him, Peter, the river church will outgrow your church. Mm. So get close to Ben. He's only got 20 members right now, but get close to Ben. He's going to need you. You're going to need him. You know, Ben's church in the Netherlands now nearly has the same amount of members as Doorbreakers. Doorbreakers shrunk. His church grew and it got about the same numbers. And in fact, I think financially, I'll tell you, Ben's church probably is up, is up growing Doorbreakers, mm. right? If you did the numbers. Mm. But it was a changing of the God, it was a moment that I felt this morning, I've got the same thing in my spirit about your church here. And, um, and so I want to say that because, um, would you just, would you just to stand up together, just to stand up straight up for me. Um, I just want you to see this, that, that, we, that there's a changing of the God, I'm not, I don't know the old God. I, I love, I love the Bahamas. I love the pastors. I'm like, but I'm just telling you, I'm blowing a trumpet because the trumpet blows during the changing of the God, and there's a new leaders coming. And I want to tell you, this is similar to what I'm seeing in Holland, what God's doing that done in them. It's like God can't do, He can't do through you what He hasn't done in you. So you've got some guy with a gift out of a Bible school and he's learned, he's got some swagger, it doesn't grow anything. God has to put something in you. And what God's put in them is similar to what I saw in Holland. And God's breathing into your city right now. Hallelujah. So I just want to say, you may be small right now, that's what you can see. I cannot see small. I'm seeing the whole movement. I'm seeing churches on all the islands. I'm seeing Eleuthera. I'm seeing a cat island. I'm seeing Exuma. I'm seeing Long Island. I see this wind blowing, this church footprint growing. And it's going to be powerful. And it's going to be the river and the river's DNA. Not copying from anybody. It's not, uh, not a manual that's been given and handed down. It is the breath of God and it's fresh. And it's happened. And the new God is moving in. And here they are. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. MC. I'm just telling you what I see. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just telling you what I see in the spirit. So that's what it is. Praise God. So, uh, I'm going to give you a little background of Overland Missions, so you, you know a little bit about us. I think you saw some videos last two, three weeks ago, so you've seen <laughs> some of our things. Um, we, um, we are like the most privileged of all preachers. <laughs> We've got the hardest job. People go, oh man, 
I can never do what you do because it's, it is tough. I mean, the distances are long. Our, our work is tough. I mean, we, we're currently building 13 mission bases in remote, remote countries, remote areas. You think building a church in a city is hard? Wait till you six hours drive from the closest refrigerator. And then you build it a big base. Yeah, so we can build it. A lot of hard work, so even this morning, I got a text from, from civil engineers texting me on how to cure concrete in certain parts of the world. And I'm like, oh, I never signed up for that, Lord. I'm a preacher. Curing concrete in like the third world country is not what I signed up for, but listen, the mission's the mission. Get the job done. The Lord said, figure it out, do whatever it takes. Amen. So, but at the end of the day, I feel like we're the most privileged of all preachers um, because our actual assignment is to go to the least, the most neglected and and, uh, and deliver the kingdom of heaven, the culture of the kingdom of heaven to those people. Mm-hmm. Most of the people who other people have said they're not worthy of us coming there. Mm-hmm. Most organizations have said we won't pay the money because it's not going to it's not going to have a return on investment for us. Those people. We end up with those people. And it is the highest privilege. Look, you bring this privilege. And honor for us. And we feel that from God. We feel the anointing in those locations. We feel like the presence of God there more than anywhere else. And so we've done that over the years. And we have a pretty big organization. I think is well, in comparison to other people. It's actually not big. It's tiny compared to the size of the league. The size of the nations in the world. Um, and we believe in God to grow and they are growing. And uh, that's one of the ambitions. And uh, Jared and I founded the organization um, 25 years ago. And we actually established the, the corporation 20 something years ago. But we, we established the organization for 30 years ago. And since to our ministry. Hallelujah. Just the background. You can look at the website and see that. I want to share a couple of things today. I hope that my visit to you would be something you remember. Um, I'm hoping that that through the word of God, some spiritual um, awakening in your understanding happens. I'm hoping that, that you would remember me by revelation that came to you and, and changed you and, and enlarged you and, and opened opportunities for your life. So saying that, I, I want to start with a, a um, just a, a story out of history that really intrigued me and interested me. Um, and, um, and through it, I, I recognize uh, how the behaviors of the world and our behaviors and, and who we are in the natural and who God calls us to be. Um, Traveling the world, um, traveling Asia, we have bases all over Asia um, and the Middle East, and uh, we get to see all these different cultures. Cultures, the Asian culture, the Vietnam, Cambodia, the Khmer, the, the Central Asia, the China, China region, the Mongolians, then you come into Syria, the Arabic nations, and Egypt, the Egyptians, and you get to North Africa, the African cultures, and we look at all these cultures, they're very, very interesting. You know what is very interesting to me? In the 11th century, which is like a long time ago, 11th century, that's when, uh, that's before like motor car engines, before cell phones. (laughs) Cell phones were only about three years ago. Mm-hmm. But before this, this was a period uh, that, um, I mean, it was a survival of the earth. It was, it was carnal, it was uh, murderous, it was conquering kings, and, and you just survived in your communities all over the world. People survived. In Europe, you go to Europe and Italy and Greece. They were like, they built these mountaintop villages on top of the hilltops with walls because at that period, people were just raiding them. They were raiding them. Raid well, at that time, a, a warlord out of Mongolia, now the Mongolians, 
uh, Mongolia was not a rich country. It wasn't. It wasn't a a uh, vast population. It's actually not a good terrain. It's very arid and cold, hard to grow stuff. But out of Mongolia came a warlord by the name of Genghis Khan. You may have studied him in history. You haven't. You should hear his name. Genghis was his first name, and last name Khan. Out of the Khan family, the Khan dynasty. Genghis Khan came out, he was, a, he was a vicious leader. He had a vision to take over the world. Now, taking over the world in a period where there's no airplanes, no trains, no cars, no bicycles, no motorbikes, to get from one location to another and take over the world, it takes time and energy because you want to know what's that. So he decided he's going to take over the world. And in his lifetime, conquered Mongolia, China, China, the whole of China. So we're talking about villages. He just got to go to Mongolia, China, India, the whole of India, Bangladesh, Syria, Iraq, Iran. The whole Central Asia, it is not a, on horseback. And the Mongolians got horses and took over the world. This, the, a small nation of warlords just decided to take over the world. Which I thought was fascinating. How do you do that? You don't have, a, you don't have the internet. You don't have telephones. No one knows you're coming. There's no television. And let me tell you what Genghis Khan did. And then, and I'll, I'll share on some of these strategies and put in place. Genghis Khan firstly invented arrows, bows and arrows, arrows that whistle. So he invented the arrow that when they shot it, whistled. <laughs> whistle. Okay. I'll tell you why. Um, because when they, when they were attacking the community, the village, they would close in the walls, they would go inside, they'd see people coming, and then they would shoot arrows over the walls. It would, it would make a sound that people would, would listen to and get afraid of. Hmm. So the sound would reinstall fear. It didn't multiply his power. It wasn't like a, a, a gun with more bullets. It was just had fear connected to it. So then an arrow would sound. He, before they attacked the village, they took trees, cut them down, and dragged them behind the horses. Because they didn't have a lot of soldiers, but they had lots of horses. So that, when they went towards the city, there would be a dust cloud. So the people would think there's thousands of people coming. And he'd put horses with, with straw people on them, Pulling bushes, make it look like a big army because they never had people to fight. They would, um, it was the first military, military operation to actually send messengers ahead of his army and set up watering points for the horses. So he'd have watering points set out for the horses and he'd send out two runners and the runners would go and tell the people, be careful. Genghis Khan's coming. People go, Genghis Khan, they don't know how big he is, they've got no television, no, no, no. All they know is the fear that was instilled in them through the horse riders. But he so protected his propaganda that he set up watering points for his horses to know, I have to send the messages to let people know that I'm coming, even though they didn't know what he looked like. When they came to the village with their whistling arrows, they would kill one person on the way in. And if, then the, the, the village or the community would lock their, their doors and gates and, and put their soldiers out. Fingers Khan would throw that body over the wall mm. and just wait. Because <laughs> now they have a dead person, a dead body, what are they going to do with it? Everyone inside the walls would see themselves dead. Mm. He'd say, that could be me. He didn't 
have to kill anyone. He just took Billy because he had fear instilled in propaganda in the people and took over the world just with this propaganda, this negative spin. So how's the story? When he took over India, I mean, I killed a lot of people. He wasn't a nice guy. Don't, don't, don't like think he was a nice guy. He was not a great guy. Killed a lot of people. But 200 years later, after Genghis Khan was dead, his great grandchild, Kugla Khan, now that Kugla Khan, was now ruling the Khan dynasty. But at that point, the dynasty was failing because 200 years later, Genghis is dead for 200 years and they were losing their power. You know what Kublai Khan did? He went to New Delhi, India. Now, India has got a billion people. And they could click their fingers and take over the Mongolians. <laughs> China could take, at that point, could have just walked over the Mongolians. But you know what Kublai Khan did? He went to New Delhi, India, collected all the skulls of the humans that had been killed by his grandfather, his great grandfather collected the skulls, and erected a tower of human skulls in existence today. Mm -hmm. Built like a pyramid of human skulls, a huge pyramid of human skulls that his great-grandfather built to remind the people if they disobey, <laughs> this is what he, they will do to them. Mm -hmm. Like just fear. Kupa Khan didn't have the power. All he had was a, was a, a temple of fear. Mm -hmm take over the world, and they took over the world for a hundred years. Amazing how when people believe a message, a, a propaganda, and receive it in their spirit, how it molds them, mm -hmm. controls them, constrains them, makes them, takes away their power, even though it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, the church of Jesus Christ, the, the church, is the biggest, the largest company by dollar in the world. It's the, it is the largest monetary organization in the world. The church. But the church can't see. There is so much power locked up in the body of Christ and in the people of the church. They've been listening and looking at towers of skulls for decades mm. can't break through. Mm. And um, I want to share this morning the word a little bit with us that would break us free from all propaganda that got delivered to us mm. through our schooling system, through our education, through the subcultures that we come out of. To our family dynasties, our um, um, personal failures and stories that have been handed to us and has happened to us, and the lies of the enemy will come and lock you up into a bondage like you gave it to a cross in the skulls, mm. failures that can remind you. The God wants to break us through. Any, well, Facts are this, he actually has broken, broken us free. We are completely free. We're just living with the propaganda in our midst. Mm. Amen. Amen. So, um, I want to start in Revelation chapter 1. You know, I have to share this because as an organization, a missions organization, we arrive into locations, into cities, into cultures that are totally different. Economically, no finance. Their farming implements are nowhere to be found. They have been human trafficked for the last 500 years. Tribes upon tribes have been selling and buying them and selling and buying them. And now we arrive in the gospel and we have only got like one week to break it off their life. Mm. You know, this is. This is this is the world I live in. And so I want to share out of the word of God what breaks this off for people. Has to be broken off the Bahamas. 
has to be broken off your life. And this is out in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead, and ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood, and made us kings and priests, Together to, uh, to sorry, kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Man, when that Bible report refers to him being a witness, it means he is the testifier, he's the one with the narrative. He's the one with the description. He's the one describing you. He holds the, the vocabulary. He's got the words Amen. that define you. Amen. The faithful witness. He's the one who should be the one describing you. Amen. Nothing else should describe you but him. The faithful witness. He's a faithful witness. His witness doesn't change over time. He doesn't measure you up and say, oh, I, 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 I used to like you, but now you're a lemon. I don't like you anymore, so your future's not so great. No, he doesn't change his opinion of you by your behaviors. His opinion of you is established because of his work in you, Amen. which you cannot tamper with. You cannot change the, the, the impact of his blood and his finished work upon your life. You cannot. All your unbelief is not stronger than his blood on his cross. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus describes you. So the thing I want to say is the first step to transformation is denying your natural identity. Amen. I just want to say, you know, um, I want to say that this is the biggest problem in the world. Uh, identity. Right now we're looking at America, are you guys watching the news? They are so confused about gender. It's crazy. As foreigners, we, we just can't believe the confusion going on in America. But Africa is like George Drofko. They don't have to wear in Uganda, Kenya, Zambia, Angola, Congo. They have, they have no gender problems. A male is a male in Africa. It's not simple. Amen. You know, and, and you're a female, you're a female. You know, there's, no, there's, no, there's no problem there. There is an identity crisis in America. And they're trying to push that crisis out of all our other countries. Yes. We have to now accept. And have three bathrooms in all of our schools in Africa. Our, our presidents are going, you're not in my time. Yeah. <laughs> it's not happening. In fact, President Obama pushed that agenda really, really hard. Africa pushed back very hard. They did not protect it. Um, but the crisis of the identity is not only in the natural world, it's in the church. The church is in an identity crisis, has not yet totally embrace the fullness of what God has done in them. Yes. They receive it in small portions in revelation and in small revelations. And there's reasons for that. The church does not walk in its identity as it's been given in Jesus Christ. So step number one to receiving the identity of Jesus is you have to deny your natural identity. That's hard. Because you actually, we actually were born with a certain amount of pride and loyalty to who we are. You know, um, and it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. I'm not saying, I'm not saying go burn them or hot and flag. It's <laughs> <This is> crazy. <laughs> but at some point in your life, you're going to take the Bahamian passport and put it on the ground, put your foot on it, and say, I will tolerate my national identity, but I will not live it. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Otherwise, you pick up your natural identity and you become a Bahama. Bahamian. What is this, Bahamian? Bahamian. 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 And let me share something about this. I'm going to say, does God say to you, Pastor Jacoby, the Bahamian? No. No. What does he say? Pastor Jacoby, son of the kingdom. That's right. He used to be a Bahamian. But he lost it. It just fell off him somewhere. His scales came off. Let me share, share something with you. You remember the Apostle Paul when the prophet Ananias, when Paul was blind, remember that on the road to Damascus, and God said to the prophet, Go to the street called Straight and find the man called Saul of Tarsus. God called him. Not Paul the Apostle. And he was already born again. Because Paul still embodied the city of Tarsus. Go look for a man. Look for a man that looks like a Tarsian. He named Saul. He was still embodying an old culture, an old identity. So much so that even God told the prophet, Go find the man that looks like a Tarshan. Hmm. That's his name, Saul. So, in your transformation as a believer, or as the church's transformation into the identity of the church, or the full identity, you will first lose the identity of your natural world. Hmm. Later on, Paul gets called... Saul, sorry, it's Paul, Paul, apostle to the Gentile nations. That's a big difference from Saul from Tarsus. Now let me explain Tarsus to you. Let me try, let me try, 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 try and make it relevant to the Bahamas. Tarsus was a town 30 kilometers inland of the Mediterranean. So it would be like Living in a town in the Bahamas that was 30 kilometers from the coast. Mm -hmm. right. What town is there? There are some, it's probably like somewhere where the Haitian like, 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 community lives. It's like people that are like, they have passports here. You know what I mean? They're like hiding out inland somewhere, away from trade zones where the police live. Inland from the Mediterranean it was not a major town, it was a small town. It was a small-minded community. Small-minded people live in small towns. So when God said to, when God refers to Paul as from Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, he's going Saul from Tarsus. People from Tarsus have a very small mind. They haven't traveled. They haven't seen the trade routes, so they've not seen the people from Greece. They haven't seen the people from Spain. They haven't seen it the Portuguese and the Turks and the Egyptians, they are living in a small town. They know nothing. But I'll tell you this. When the power of God came on Paul through the gospel, mm. through the gospel, through the, the, the understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the gospel, when it came on him by revelation, he became Paul All apostles of the Gentile nation. Somehow, inside of him, the Spaniards were found. Mm. The Portuguese were found. The barbarians were there. The Jews were there. In his spirit, even though in a small town, never ever seen them, never been educated about them. See, what happens when, when the power of God comes on you through the gospel, you, you're, like, you're like six foot tall. To start with, suddenly you're 12 foot tall. Your large your spring is so large, every nation fits in. You're not walking with a chip on your shoulder anymore about your color, your creed, your background, your education, your, 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 your economy, your bank account. It can shed off your life when your natural identity dies. All those things die. It amazes me 
I'm going to think on America because I'm not an American. I'm close enough to think on it. Most of you have been there, so you probably agree with me. But um, the, um, the church in America, the hurt in America, the hurt in America, the hurt in America is, is racial. There's a lot of racial hurt in America. For some reason, as a, as a South African, you remember the history of South Africa, right? Mm. I mean, apartheid. I went to schools where black people, can you believe this? I can't even believe I, I, I have to describe this to anyone. We're not allowed in white schools, and we weren't allowed in black schools. Mm. We weren't, it was against the law to marry. Go to jail. Restaurants, everything, they separated everything. It was ridiculous. And I had to, I was submitted to that. I was a young school kid during that era. Coming out of that when Nelson Mandela and our country being set free was glorious. Beautiful. I go to America, it's worse than South Africa in the early days. People are hurt against each other. And just the fact, and I can deal with that, because I came from that, but it's in the church that they're going to suspect. It's in the church, the very place where we shame, we, we, we deny our national existence upon the earth, our origins, we deny it all so that we can have this. Yes. Yeah. Still chips on their shoulders, amazing to me. Hindering the move of God in their life, and hindering the flow that God wants through them. You see, when, when you live in the identity of the new creation, of the new man, when you live in it, there's a flow through you that's massive. There's a financial flow, a huge financial flow. I mean, guys, if you're a business here today, if you call to business, and you receive this word, you can do anything. You can be as rich as you want, because through you can flow and a large amount of the neuron from Tarsus City Hall, you know, from small islanders, you know, from small outcomes. You suddenly from an outcome where Saul of Tarsus Paul apostle to the Gentile oh. nation. Amen. Amen. Huge enlargement when you receive what God has put up your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're a preacher of the gospel here today, God has massive vision for the impact of your life upon the earth. Hallelujah. Amen. He has vision for it. He can't do it if we live in an identity still molded by Adam. Mm. Adamic nature. Yeah. Yeah. Can't do it. You can talk all your life. You can, you can preach. You can pray. You can prophesy. Your outcomes will be small until you receive in you the word and shed the, the natural man. Hallelujah. So I want to say deny your natural identity so God can give you his identity in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So um, we can turn to first Peter. It's actually second Peter chapter one. I'm going to read this. Chapter 1. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him, He called us by glory and virtue. Now that word knowledge there is the Greek word epigenosis. So Greek the word knowledge like school knowledge, school teachers here today. Knowledge is gnosis. That's the Greek word. Gnosis. Knowledge. In the New Testament, New Testament they use the word epigenosis. It means beyond knowledge. Beyond arithmetic. Beyond um, human logic comes what is called revelation knowledge in our English language, but it's epigenosis. 
It's the when the preaching of the gospel comes to you and I say to you, God gave you a brand new man, a new creation for you to live in and move and your spirit agrees with it. Mm. You, you, in your heart, you go, I know that's true. Yeah. I know that's for me. I know I'm included. That's spiritual revelation. Yeah. That's spirit knowledge. So he says, grace will be multiplied to you in this revelation on when your spirit agrees with Jesus Christ. As his divine power has given you sorry, I'm actually quoting Ephesians as I'm reading. Oh. <laughs> as the divine power has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness through this revelation knowledge of Him called just for interest's sake, you scholars out there, verse 5. But for but also for this very reason, giving giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge. See, so he uses knowledge there. That's not a gnosis, it's a different word. So, here yeah, in English, we just use knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. It's, that is the word gnosis. Add to your virtue knowledge. Be, be diligent in knowledge. But understand that there is a revelation of knowledge, there is a spiritual understanding of your identity in Christ Jesus that forms you, that breaks, that breaks everything off. Mm -hmm. And once you walk in it, once you walk in it, I can blindfold you, put you on the helicopter, drop you anywhere in the world, and you will flourish, thrive, mm. thrive. No matter where you go, what you do, no matter what you want to do, because once you live in it, Anywhere you go, you will you will flourish. It's like parents. How many parents do I have here today? Moms and dads. You know, you look at your kids and you say, all of us parents, we go, man, I wonder what it's gonna be like for them. I wonder if they're gonna have to struggle like I struggle. I wonder if they're gonna have to live like we live. I wonder if they and this is the big one. I wonder if they're gonna encounter you, Lord, like because you know the day you encounter the Lord in you, you sent from this man. Yeah. But you look at your kids, but you can't just give it to them, right? right. You can't mandate it. Uh, you must have revelation. <laughs> you must have the spirit knowledge. You must have Jesus. And I'll tell you this that the day will come, and the day has come in our life. The day will come for your parents that your kids, and you'll know the day that they have their own encounter with God. And revelation comes on them and they're no longer born from your womb. They're no longer hanging off your apron strings. They connect to the heart. And that moment, you can rejoice because I promise you, they, you can blunt on them now and you can drop them anywhere. Mm. You can put them in the Fiji Islands. On the other side of the world, you know, I'm just saying the most opposite place to me right now is the Fiji Island. You can get further away from the Bahamas. <laughs> you put them in Fiji Islands and rest at peace because they're proudly in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. On the other side, if you are a religious believer and you link your relationship with God to, to venues, so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a member of this church or I'm connected to this venue or you connect to a only to a movement and to a preacher, and your identity is wrapped up in a religious uh, model. You're in danger. Your kids are in danger, and the move of God will not flow through that church. It builds that. Way. That's why I have great confidence in the river, because I, I know the river movement is not going to allow you. To be iconic, not going to allow you to create venues that supersede the moving of the Spirit of God or um, of 
growth models that exclude the Holy Spirit yes. and, you, and, and, and the, the worship, the true worship Amen. of God. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Seventeen says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Mm. Powerful. Uh, let me just pause there while I just need to expand on that. Man. Um, political governments around the world cannot deal with social crisis. They try. They have social. They have. They have social. Um, they have social uh, departments that deal with mental health. They can't deal with. It. They rely on their communities to deal with social problems. In most cases, in the Christian world, it's the churches. In the Islamic world, it's the mosques. In the in the Hindu world, it's the te Buddhist temples. They rely on the communities for social social welfare. But most most works of the flesh cannot help anyone. Yeah. Actually can't help them. They will medicate you, they'll drug you now. Because um, this that's the quickest way to stabilize your problem. When you're having a bad day, just anti-anxiety medication. You use some anti-anxiety, or then you're living in a book talk. Mm. And you and you turn drugs the rest of your life. <laughs> Bible says this: where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Amen. I went to a church in Nashville, Tennessee, big church, and I was a speaker. I'm an African preacher, so we can preach for hours. I won't preach for hours today. It's all right. We'll let you go. We'll let you go. <laughs> it's fine. But we can <laughs> preach for hours. They bring me to a church in Nashville. There's five services on a Sunday morning. Pastor says to me, listen to me, you have 17 minutes. One seven. And, and there's a clock on the left wall. And you don't listen to that service? One service was Donna Summer. Remember Donna Summer? Mm -hmm. the, the, the artist? No. Uh, no. She did, that, she did that song. Um, it's all on the Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> she was there. And with her was, a, was the girl that wrote um, um, 99 Red Balloons out of Europe. I don't know that. Anyway, it's Nashville. Anyone's in the room? There's a, in the church, there's all these musicians. Yeah. It's in the 17 minutes. And there's this huge clock on the back wall. It's digital. Like the size of that. Mm -hmm. Counting me down. 1659. 1658. I have five services to preach for 17 minutes. Same service, same message. I'm like, that's the most boring thing. I'm not doing the same message. Five times, the most boring thing. Okay, when we start standing, standing I, he said, that's it, that's the same one, every single service, so that some people are not denied. It can't be better than someone else. I was like, I, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> so I preached five different services, sentence. And um, so, anyway, driving the car back to the airport that same day with the pastor, I said, Pastor, I said, can I have a comment? Because we've got Donna Summer, we've got all these fancy people, there's 3,000 people in the church. It's a big, big, big performance. I said, can I comment? He said, yeah. I said, the number one priority in your church right now is the first time visitor. Hmm. The second priority in your church is the biggest tithes hmm. givers, the most faithful. Oh, further, the, the third is the air conditioner temperature. Because the temperature is not right. I literally, the pastor has a temperature control. <laughs> See, there's no kind of temperature. Because he sees some, some, some little Donna, some important person getting hot. <laughs> so, number three, temperature. 
way down the line, I said way down the list, somewhere way down the point, is the Holy Spirit. Mm. He's definitely not the Lord. 17 minutes. He doesn't have any time. He gave him zero. Mm. Amen. He's so far down the list. He said, there's a problem in the church. I was so lucky at that. Yes. And he was like, yeah. But he's a friend of mine, so I can say these things. I wouldn't say this to someone that wasn't a friend. But um, the scripture is very clear. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Mm-hmm. I'd, be, I'd be making number one mission if it was me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when your pastor starts pushing you to press into the Spirit of God, the things of God, and not give you this fancy uh, talk of uh, growth and growth models. <laughs> Trust me. Follow. Amen. Follow, follow. Amen. Amen. Because one thing we want is liberty. We don't want to be aged, predictable. We don't want the Holy Ghost to say, oh, go get Philip from Tarsus. Go get that Philip from Tarsus. You know, you can find me from a small town in South Africa. Racist community. My dad is poor, a truck driver. I told my son yesterday, I said, I said, you're the second born. I was the second born. I never ever got new clothes. Mm-hmm. Ever. Mm-hmm. That's maybe like you. Hand me down from the brother. My brother got the new clothes, I got hand me down. I never got new school clothes. Never. Mm-hmm. Brother school shoes, brother school, everything. But uh, you think, oh, because I was like that. My kids are going to leave. No, I'll break that thing off me. I'm not going to be living in poverty. God called me to the nations. You think I'm going to be a poor person? Amen. Gave me a mandate. Ask me and I'll give you the nations and your Amen. inheritance Amen. and the ends of the earth for your possession. You think I'm going to embrace poverty? I'm believing for millions and millions Amen. and tens of millions. Amen. To steward for his name's sake. Hallelujah. Break it off. Um, and this is the verse I want to share. It goes 18. But we all, with an unveiled face, behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory. And we all, with an unveiled face, I can share on this longer, there's a lot to be talked about here, but the veil over our face was the works of the flesh, that which we used to prove ourselves worthy. Prayer meetings, swagger, whatever your trick is that made you feel like you were an important believer, those works of the flesh is a okay. You have to deny yourself on all of those and receive His work on your life to be free. Amen. It says, we with an unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Here's the truth. Most of us here, when we look in the mirror, we see ourselves from a natural point of view. You see your family line, you see your last name, we see you by your achievements, by your failures, you see the athlete in the mirror, and the lady, you see this beautiful. Um, Model, I don't know what you see, but you see yourself off with the flesh in the mirror. In the, in the definition of a believer, when we see the mirror, reflection of ourselves, we see Jesus. So let me ask you, when you look in the mirror, do you see what you looked like last year? Do you, do you see what you'll look like 10 years from now? No. You see yourself in the now, in the present. Yes. So it says, we with an unveiled face behold him as in the mirror, I change into that same glory. So you say, what's the potential of my life? Whatever Jesus is. Come on. Amen. 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 How Amen. much money can I can flow through me? However much Jesus can handle. Amen. How much re- anointing, as a pastor, how much anointing can I take? How much anointing do I have? 
as much as Jesus has? It's on you. And it's right now. It cannot be earned. It's not in the future. It's in the present. It's in the present. This was this revelation was the end the anchor in my life that took me out of my tasks. Took me out of the def definition of my life. I came from a town called East London on the coast of South Africa, a small town, depressed. To this day, a depressed economic town. People in East London didn't become rich, didn't become great, didn't have a big footprint, didn't have world-changing organization. They love surfing in East London. It's like a little beach town. We can do this, that's all that's possible. You, you get an off day job so you can surf the rest of the day. I mean, poverty and you just live by hand to mouth. But when I looked in the mirror, I didn't see someone from East London. I saw Jesus in me. Amen. And because of that, I am constrained to live in Him. Amen. So when somebody says to me, You can't do that. I look in the mirror to see if I can or can't. <laughs> I look at him. I thought, I don't know, I'm not receiving that. Let me just have a look. No, no, I'm fine. I, I can see, I can do it. Amen. Well, you shouldn't go there. I look in the mirror. Then I'm going there. Because remember, in the third world countries, you're alive in a country. Everyone wants to advise you. You want to get advised. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> don't, don't be that person. Oh, they don't exist anymore. Those people will never receive you. Oh, those are very dangerous people. They'll kill you if you go there. Like, I just look in the mirror, no, no, they won't receive me, they receive them. Yeah. And then I love the gospel, don't, don't go there, Jesus, no, he went there, I'll go there. And we never, he listened to anyone else anymore when it comes to advice on ter terrestrial work. Because it's all lies. Mm. So people believe in the lie. Look in the mirror. Mm. And they will receive everything, and receive everything. And I share this deep truth with you today, in hope that your church is so young, this church, this river church, you're young. You're small in a sense. You're not small, but you're small in number, which is actually awesome. Because you know? in smallness, you get, to, you get to set DNA. It's hard to set the DNA when you're huge. You have to set it when you're small. You have to preach these messages over and over until everyone gets it. Yeah. Until everyone's looking in the mirror and not listening to the world. Yeah. And then suddenly, you can grow, it's controllable. But your church is at a level now where you're such an exciting state of growth. Such a powerful community. And your age group is potent for what God's going to do through you. Your influence right now, immense. As you grab these revelations, this epigenosis in your spirit, let it define you on the way forward. Let it describe your buildings. Mm -hmm. Let it describe how long you have services. Let it describe how your worship sounds. You know, we, we, we started our music division um, a couple of years ago. So people were writing songs. And we were like, that's so good. Other people should worship. But you know, the problem was this. In the music industry out of Nashville, Tennessee, it's all a merchandising industry. Mm -hmm. it's, it's evil, actually. You write a song, if you write a song, you better um, get, you better um, trademark that thing. Because if you don't, then it's good. Nashville will trademark it and ban you from singing. Mm -hmm. And if they trademark it, it's just boom, they trademark it in 20 minutes. And those Christian believers will put their name on their song as they wrote it. And they've done it over and over to friends of ours. Won't believe it. They'll say, I wrote the song. Look, names that you know. They wrote it. They wrote it. They never wanted it. They stole that thing. Wow. It's all merchandising, money, and it's terrible. So we said, not all of them, but they're parts are right from the actual industry side. The industry side is really evil. So we said, okay, if we don't write songs, we're going to give them away for free. And we're not going to charge people. And we're not going to put labels. We're not even going to put who authored the songs on it. So that someone can get paid. Because how it works is Spotify only publishes the song if there's an author. 
And then they went monetize that slot and they sent the money, not to the publisher, they split it and they sent money to the author. So if you, if you were present, if you were present during the writing of the song, you were just in the room like this, then that sounds good. That's a contribution. You can add it. And money spots have to get delivered straight to you from Spotify. So when, that, when you start that nightmare, it becomes about money. Mm. Now we're writing songs for money. Imagine writing a worship wow. song to the king. Mm. Who are we going to worship? Because I want a bit of cash. Yeah. Wow. So the motive is wrong. So we said no. But it took us six months with lawyers in New York, New York trademark lawyers, to figure out how to publish music without payment. Because there is no model. Wow. And, we, and the danger is we will get sued later on if someone, if they don't do it right, because imagine someone was in the room mm -hmm. when the song was written, and then song goes big, then they sue wow. us. I was in the room, I want all of the monies or something. Wow. It would get crazy. But we, we um, managed to get it right so that we would give our stuff away for free yeah. and be safe from, from the industry. Mm -hmm. We did it because, because um, we didn't believe what everyone told us. Everyone said, no, you can't do that. We went and did it. We want to do it for free, we did it. Mm -hmm. We broke free from a bondage. If the industry has in the name of Jesus, but it's not right. Mm -hmm. We broke out of it. And so your church is going to be like this. Amen. Um, let me share in closing today. You know, I've said a couple of things, I'll, I'll reiterate. You will have churches of all the others and beyond. Your pastors will come from within. They won't come from without. No. They're not going to be farmed in and hired in. They will come from within your body. No. They will both be your race. Um, so here's the secret of the strategies that God puts forth. Because we wonder, what's the strategy of growth? What's the strategy of church planning? What's the strategy... The mirror reflection of Jesus shells, sheds its ident natural identities and understands the strategy of heaven. There is nothing that can stop you. Nothing. Nothing that can stop you. Zero. No political Bahamian government. No LGBT community agenda. No, no economic woes. Economic words. Oh, oh my gosh, the, the, the Bahamian uh, dollar. What is it? Dollar? Mm -hmm. It's a Bahamian dollar, right? Mm -hmm. The Bahamian dollar is linked to the US dollar. And look at the US dollar. China's about to take over the currency of the world. You know, this is the economic words. It's nothing. Why? Because you, you're just looking at linear. Yeah. You're just looking at dynasties. Just give me a linear. That's all I ask. I don't ask for money. I don't ask for. Fame, I don't ask for beauty, I don't ask for glory. All I ask for is Lily alone. Yeah. All I ask for is Daddy. It's just one person hungry, one person thirsty. I promise you will shake the city of Nassau, in the island of New Providence. Just give me Daddy. And I will declare to you this day this room has got Lydia in it, and it has Daddy in it. It's already here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's already here. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, there's nothing that can stop you. Amen. That's something. Number two, changing of the God. There's a changing of the God. And only God can do that. This is not a man thing. God does it. He brings new leadership and new times. And when changing of the God takes place, um, there is a fresh wind. You can't manufacture it. You can't manufacture it. You can't buy smoke machines. Smoke machines don't do it. <laughs> the change is that this is happening. And, and I, I'm here today. And the next time I come, this place will be very different. It will be, it will be even more embodied. It will just grow into this body that, 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 that receives the spirit. Through that, your life will all prosper. Every last one of you will prosper. In every way. 
your sickness will be gone, your businesses will succeed, your children will, will succeed, your, your parents will not grow old and die, of, uh, well, sorry, will not die young, your, your, your elders, they won't be healthy. It's just going to be part of your story. A healthy, powerful community of faith. Amen. Amen. That's the word today. Let's stand up. Amen. Stand up with me. I'm not asking you to do something this morning. Um, if you put your hands on your eyes, just like this, as I pray, and I'm going to pray that you, that when you look into the mirror, the word of God, the mirror reflection of Jesus, that you will begin to see by revelation, see by revelation, the mystery of the kingdom and the mystery of the word of God. And I'm going to pray for a very thing that there's a unity of vision upon this church and that as you all see the same and all have vision and miraculous divine revelation of the mystery of the, of the word of God in Jesus' name. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you open the eyes of every member of this church. In Jesus' name, I command right now that the, that the blindness that has been on the body will be gone from them in Jesus' name. That you open their eyes, open their spirit to see as you see, to hear as you hear, to understand as you understand. In Jesus' name I pray, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, as you do that, when you take your hand and if you're sick in any way in your body, put it somewhere where that sickness is, you can send your that sickness because by revelation, when revelation comes, so it comes faith. Faith will come on you. Father, right now, as they lay their hands upon those, their bodies, I command every body, every, every bone, every structure, every muscle, every sinew, Every part of the flesh of their bodies of this entire church is made whole right now in Jesus' name. All sickness is gone from this church. And let it be the testament. Let it be the, let it be the signature of this church that everyone who comes through the doors are always healed in this church. In Jesus' name, Jesus. Now, if you have. If you have a business or you have a, 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 a career that's, that is how you live, I want you to just hold your hand closed up like this. It's like you're holding your tie, like you're holding the word of God. Hold that up in the hand. Father, I thank you right now. As, as every, every steward, every servant, every civil servant in this society that's, that's here in us. Father, I pray in multiplication of the anointing upon them for their work in Jesus' name. That favor come upon them, that increase come upon them, that promotion come upon them in Jesus' name. Give them, give them inventions, give them, give them entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial spirits, and give them gifts in kind and in the mail and blessings upon them in Jesus' name. I pray. And then this also be a signature of this church. That everyone who comes into the doors of this building always is blessed to find Jesus. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Now, if you're below the age of 17, you're below the age of 17, lift up both your arms. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, God. Father, I pray for the youth of this church that the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of God come upon them in Jesus' name. The fire of the Holy Ghost, same fire that came on you, come on you. Same fire, come on you. Same fire, Lord. Same fire. Same fire of the Holy Ghost in my children. Thank you, Lord. Same fire of the Holy Ghost in my children. Same fire of the Holy Ghost in my Same fire that came on me, came on you, Jesus. Same fire. 
Same fire. Same fire as you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Pastor Jacoby. Oh, I'll tell you how much I love you. <laughs> and I'm so excited about what God's doing now. <laughs> and and uh, I thank you for not joining other ambitions. <laughs> but you actually did join other ambitions. Yeah, I know. I think you did join it with you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> 